Hi, I'm Greg McDaniel, lead teaching pastor here at Grace Covenant Church. And we're excited about this opportunity we have to share the glorious gospel of Christ with you today. We pray this sermon's a blessing to you, but I also wanna remind you what it tells us in Hebrews. It says that we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the habit of some is, but we're to encourage one another to love and good works. The way we do this is by physically coming together, uniting together and building each other up. And so whether you are a member here at Grace Covenant or just listening online, I wanna remind you that this is just a supplement to your Christian walk and in no way is meant to replace the local church or the pastors that God has brought into your life. So on that note, you see that we're still in the Sermon on the Mount and we are still moving through uh, the, the tougher portions. And that's one thing about expository preaching that I like and my flesh dislikes, but the, the point is there's no cherry picking in the, in the preparation of sermons. Um, if, you know, I think if most people are honest, they're not thinking about, let's preach on adultery one week and divorce the next. That's a good idea. Um, but normally, you know, obviously, as I said, you wouldn't do that. But as we go through the Bible and let the Bible speak for itself, we come to these places that are hard and we need to hear what God says about all, all things. And so that's what we do here. We preach through the Bible, expository, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, through books of the Bible. And so today we have hit this subject that we all have, a, have one way or another come in contact with. It's touched our lives in some way. So I don't approach this flippantly today. I know that divorce is a painful subject and many have either experienced this uh, firsthand or from parents or family, friends. And yet the Bible does speak on this subject and we must, as believers who claim to put our trust in Christ and therefore submit to his word, we must hear his word on these things. So as we look at divorce, I mean, how many of you heard the old statistic, 50% of marriages end in divorce and it's pretty much the same in the church, one out of two marriages and it's getting worse as time goes on. How many have heard that statistic, right? It's been repeated over and over and over. But I'm going to give us a little good news before we begin um, today. Now, we know statistics, we've got to be careful with statistics, right? Somebody once said, most people use statistics the way a drunk uses a streetlight, not for illumination, but for support. So you got to kind of be careful, obviously, about statistics. They can be manipulated, and, and it depends on the sample group, sample size, all these different things. But recently, many uh, more statisticians and, and research groups have brought out some more estimates that are a little more accurate about divorce. And um, basically, in 2015, the CDC reported that the divorce rate was actually 36%. And that in 20, uh, 20 that, by the way, that was down from a high of 41% in 2002. As a matter of fact, most statisticians now agree that the divorce rate has never gone beyond 44%. In America. Now, that's a little good news. It's still very high, still very bad. Divorce period is not a good thing. Um, but yet, I want to encourage us. Why do I want to encourage us with this? Well, basically, let us know those who are, who are faithful to marriage and, and working hard to keep your marriage. Uh, sometimes, if we hear, well, what's the use, right? It's ridiculous. Everybody's getting divorced. One out of two, maybe even more. Forget marriage. No, I, I, I'm encouraging us because what that tells us is that people still believe in marriage. Uh, for the most part, people, non-believers as well, when they get married, they get married for life. They, they're thinking this in their mind. They still believe. Why is that? Why, do, why is, is that true? Because divorce, I'm sorry, because marriage, rather, is an institution built by God for his people. And I think most people innately know that this is right, that marriage is for one man and one woman to be together for life. I think, I think we know, understand that. Now, sin, of course, is real. <laughs> we know that. We're sinners. We're not perfect. And therefore, we see this thing called divorce. And today, we're going to look and see exactly what Christ tells us about this thing. And the first thing we're going to notice is the Pharisees. Again, as usual, this is the pattern that we see in the Sermon on the Mount, that Jesus brings up what the Pharisees taught wrongly about the law, and he is now going to interpret the law properly and say, here's what the law really means because I gave the law because I'm God and I'm able to do that. So, so that's what we're going to see today. So before we begin, let's pray and ask God's blessing on 
his word and on our hearts. Father, we pray that now over the next few minutes, your spirit will come and just give us patience and also give us ears to hear and also give us hearts that will be soft in your hands, that your Holy Spirit will guide us into truth and give us a heart to obey you. And most of all, let us see your grace and your mercy and let us see Christ high and lifted up, worthy of all praise. And we pray these things in his name. Amen. So Matthew 5, verse 31 says, and this is where Jesus begins. He says, it was also said. And we know what he's saying there when he says, it was said, or you have heard. He's talking about the Pharisees through all of the years that they have now been interpreting the law. They have changed some things. They have reinterpreted some things. They've added some things. But he, he, he reminds them, here's what you've heard. Here's the tradition that has been taught for centuries. Whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. Now, what is this certificate of divorce that Jesus mentions here? Well, he's talking about Deuteronomy 24, verse 1, which talks about the written divorcement uh, certificate. And basically, it says that if a man takes a wife and he marries her, and then he finds fault with her, and the way the, the Bible uses that is says if he finds some indecency in her, he can give her a written certificate of divorcement, and put her away. Now, what divorce really is, folks, what that means is it gave her the right to remarry. A divorce, that written certificate of divorcement, meant that she would not be stoned as an adulterer if she married somebody else. That, that was what that was. So it was this release, basically, a release from, from the marriage, and therefore she could go marry another. However, the law stipulated that if that man the new person that she has married also finds a fault with her and divorces her. She could never, ever go back and remarry the first husband. So that divorce did some things. It was a permanent situation. There was never, no way to second think. And well, I'm just, I was wrong. Let's get married again. Nope. Once that divorce certificate was given, that person could never go back to that original husband. Probably given so that he would think twice before doing that, before giving fluke you know, just frivolously a divorce. I had to think through this. This is permanent. This is, this, is, this is forever. And then also, as I said, to protect the woman. Because again, back in this day, back, back during the time of Deuteronomy, adultery and fornication was punishable by stoning. So again, what happens here is this divorce certificate shows everyone that she is now legally able to be re remarried. So that's what that was. That's just, this is what we're talking about, and I'm not going to get into all the nuances. And by the way, let me say, too, before I, we get in, really into this message, I'm not going to hit every single thing about divorce. I can't do it. I mean, we, we'd be here a, a long time. Um, so we're going to look at this passage, what Jesus is talking about in context, and there may be things you have questions about as I preach. That's okay. You can talk to me later or, or email or whatever. That's, that's great. But I just want to make sure that we understand this is not an all-exhaustive covering of, of divorce. But it is going to show us what Jesus thinks compared to what the Pharisees think. Now, when they said, uh, uh, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce, what they're saying is they're more concerned about this certificate, this, this outward thing. You can divorce your wife for any reason, doesn't matter. As long as she has that certificate, right, you've got to make sure you give her the certificate of divorce. And that's kind of what they're looking at here. And so Jesus was saying, this is what you've heard, right? Just get that certificate of divorce and you're good to go. Now, to understand some more of this, we have to look at the culture and understand the great debate that was taking place about this about 10 years before Jesus started his earthly ministry. There was this great debate between two rabbinical schools of the day, the rabbinical school of Shammai and Hillel. Okay, those two schools had debated this under those two rabbis, and they saw it very different. And basically, Shammai, the Shammai school, uh, very conservative, and that rabbi taught that the only grounds for divorce was adultery, was, was a, the, 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 the sexual immorality or infidelity within marriage. That was it. So very conservative. The Halil school taught, they were very liberal, and they taught that the, the reason for divorce could be pretty much anything. This is the origination of no-fault divorce, these, these guys. And they, they basically said, uh, if we can trust Josephus, uh, Josephus, Josephus, and his historical records, uh, the person under this teaching could divorce their wife because she burned the dinner. Uh, or, as we see in the Mishnah, 
Many would divorce their wife if they found another to be more attractive than her. That was a good reason. Oh, sounds good to me. Let's just do that. Oh, my wife's 40. I'll trade her on two 20-year-olds. I mean, I'm just saying, but I mean, you know, this, this concept of whatever, you know, you're just done with marriage, done with your wife, and you just divorce her, and as long as you've got this certificate, then everything's fine. That was the school of Helio. Now, which do you think the Pharisees gravitated to? Well, surprise, surprise, they gravitated to Helio. And therefore, they were now teaching for decades uh, now, about a decade, that, hey, anything is fine as, as, as far as getting a written certificate for divorce. So that's what's accepted right now during this time, okay? This, this, this no-fault divorce. Any reason. We can put our wives away. That's divorce, by the way, to put my wife away or to divorce my wife. I can do that for any reason. And by the way, again, culturally during this time, only men could divorce, women could not. They could petition the courts and in rare cases be granted uh, a divorce. Mainly this was the, the man saying, okay, I'm putting my wife away for whatever reason I want. As long as I've got a certificate, I'm good to go. Now this is the, an abbreviated account okay, of, of this situation. In Matthew 19, we have a much lengthier account of Jesus dealing with the Pharisees on this very same subject. And so as we now, what we're doing today, as we read the word, we're interpreting Scripture as well. We're exegeting the Scriptures. We're going through and seeing what it says. And so in hermeneutics, which means interpretation, so we're doing that, right? There's a rule. And it says that when there are two occurrences of the same account in the Scriptures, we interpret the smaller account by the lengthier account, meaning there's more evidence over here. There's more things said about it in the lengthier account. So we'll get some, some ideas of what Jesus really says about divorce from Matthew 19, which has a lot more uh, to, to, to kind of give us some, fill in some of the details here. So let's look at that. Let's look at Matthew 19, and uh, we'll look at verses 3 through 6, and here's what we see. And the Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking. So they knew about this debate, and they knew that where they stood. They knew what the popularly accepted uh, idea was, that divorce is good any reason, doesn't matter what the reason is. And so they say, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? And he answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife? And the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. I think it's very important to, to see what's going on. Look, the, the, the Pharisees were preoccupied with the grounds for divorce. Jesus, however, was preoccupied with marriage. You see, there's a big difference here. The Pharisees are preoccupied with how, you know, what are the grounds that I can divorce my wife? Whereas Jesus doesn't even answer their question because he's more preoccupied with marriage. So he kind of ignores their, their question. He does not really answer their question. You see, their source, this is, this is, he, he asked them, what's the source for your belief on divorce? That's really where he goes. What's your source? Their source, basically, was cultural relevance, right? I mean, their source was what's the accepted cultural thing to do. Their source is basically following modern practices and following my heart and what I think would, uh, would, would be the best, not following the accepted true word of God or, or the true word of God, whether it's accepted or not. So, so here it is. I mean, I mean, I mean vitally, we, basically, we all have to decide what we're going to base our beliefs on, right? What, what am I going to base my belief on marriage? What am I going to base my belief on divorce? What am I going to base my belief on sex before marriage? What am I going to base my beliefs about people living together outside of marriage? I mean, all these things are, are, are things that our culture deals with, right? And we as believers must be ready to give an account for all the things we believe and know why we believe it. And so Jesus is asking him, have you not read? So what's he referring to there? He's referring to the scriptures. He's referring to the whole Old Testament, Basically, Christ is saying, what are you basing this belief about a man could put his wife away for any cause? Have you not read the Scriptures? So he takes them right back to the Bible and says, Where, where's your foundational understanding of God and what he has revealed in his word? You're so caught up with cultural relevance that you have no idea what the eternal 
creator has laid out in his word. And there, folks, there is where all of us are convicted. What are we going to base our beliefs on? How are we going to live life? Therefore, we can follow accepted customs or we can follow the eternal word of God. Now, something very important here while we're here. This, this Matthew 19 is very powerful. There are some serious doctrines taught right here within these few verses. Again, not very popular positions, but yet this is God himself talking to us. And so I think it's important. A lot of questions can be answered if we submit ourselves to the scriptures and especially to this passage of scripture. So there are three vitally important foundational theological truths taught right here in Matthew 19, okay? What do we see? So which are they? Well, number one, we see the truth about creation. Truth about creation. I mean, that's a question today, right? Did God make the world, or did evolution do this? Are we accidents? Did we just evolve out of nothingness and so forth? Well, Jesus made it very plain when he said, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them? You see that language? What Jesus is saying is without a without a doubt, unequivocally, that God created us and the world from the beginning. So the doctrine of creation is laid out here by Jesus himself right there in Matthew 19. And reminding us that we did not make ourselves, but God made us. And not only did God make us, but he sustains us and holds our very breath in his hands. He's the one with whom we have to do. He's the one to whom we must all give an account one day. So that's, that's, a, that's a very powerful truth and teaching there, the truth about creation and who God is. But number two, the truth about gender and sexuality is answered right here in this, this small portion of Scripture, these few verses, where Jesus addresses this question surprisingly about how, what are the grounds that I can divorce my wife? And, and now Jesus addresses all of these huge issues in just a few sentences. God is the creator And here's how he made human beings. He made them male and female. There's gender. There's no question. See, we cannot let society and this this culture of modern entity that has taken God and any morality off the table, and now it's all about what we feel, and now we want to accommodate anything that we want to do. And therefore, we can justify it. And we can say, well... You may have been born this way, but you can identify any way that you choose to identify. There's a man in Europe that identifies now as a llama. And he's out there with llamas, living his life. On college campuses, you see interviews of of smart young people with brains. I mean, these are college students. And they'll ask questions to some of these people, and they'll, they'll see somebody that's clearly not what they're saying. And I'm just going to use an example. I, I, I'm just using examples for this, for, for this purpose. So you have, like, a Ryan here who's clearly a Caucasian guy, just a, a, a white West Sider right there, right? Redneck from West Side. That's what we got. I love you, Ryan. So there you are. But, but they look at a guy like that, and they, they talk to this young lady. They say, that, what if I told you that guy over there identified as a, 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 an, an Asian and he's, he's from Asia, and he's, and, he's, I mean, clear, and he's a woman. He's a woman from Asia. What do you think? And the girl would answer, well, if he thinks that, then who am I to say he, he's not that, and I must respect his wishes, and I will identify him as that because that's his truth, and therefore we can't deny that, and who are we to question? I'm just saying this is where our culture is right now. For the, for the most part, we're being handed this, at least by the media, and at least by, by uh, some academia, to say, look, this is however you want to identify. But here's the problem. God said himself, I made you. And I created human beings. I made them male and female. There is a gender. There's gender. We have gender. God made it that way. And we must trust the word of God. Now, am I... Am I Minimizing the pain that comes from a lot of sin? No. We are sinners, folks. 
And, and this is a result. These, these things that we deal with in life, they're, they're the result of brokenness. And I don't want to minimize the pain of families who deal with transgenderism and, and, and questions. I understand some of, that, some of that is brought on by a me that pushes it. But also, we're born sinners. We're born confused. We're born broken. But that doesn't mean we throw out the very truth of God's word. We patiently and lovingly lead people to the truth of the word of God, to the gospel, the only thing that can change us and reform us and give us an ability and a willingness to say, Lord, I want to conform to what's right, to what you have laid down in your word. So I trust you and your word, and I'll live by your commands. So there, very plainly, though, we cannot deny, even though it hurts sometimes, and even though it's painful, and even though we know people, and these are human beings we're talking about, and so what do we do, as Paul said? We love all people. We approach them with gentleness and respect. We're all created in the image of God to bear his, his, his glory, but we cannot, by doing that, deny the truths of God's word. So we stand on what? That God made, male and female. That biologically, what you were born does matter. Because God ordained that. And we must rest in that. So there it is. But, the, but also, Jesus gives us the truth about marriage in this. So we have the truth about creation, the truth about gender and, and, and sexuality, because marriage answers that. It says, it says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And then this is, is, is a sexual Connotation here, sexual term, two becoming one flesh in the marriage bed. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man put asunder. So what do we learn about marriage from Christ himself? We learn first and foremost that it is between a man and a woman. Therefore, marriage cannot be identified as anything else because God instituted marriage, not government and not the church. God did this. And so therefore, we cannot redefine it as much as we'd like to. There's only one definition of what marriage is according to the Bible, and it's when a man leaves his father and mother and cleaves unto his wife, and they become one. That's, that's marriage. And he goes on to say that marriage is lifelong. What God has joined together, let no man separate. So these are the teachings that we see on marriage. So what Jesus does, he doesn't really just jump to their thing about, well, what's the grounds for divorce, and what can I get by with, and what can I... He says, let's just talk about marriage. Let's look at the beauty and the glory of the institution of marriage. Have you not read it? Have you not seen it in the scriptures? Have you not submitted to the God of the universe? Well, the Pharisees' rebuttal, we see in verses 7 and 8 here of chapter 19. They said to him, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? I love how these guys are twisting it. Well, I mean, Moses commanded us to divorce our wives and to send them away. <laughs> they, I mean, literally, I believe what we're seeing in this is that they have moved that far away. I mean, in their minds, divorce was just a way of, of life. As long as you got that certificate. Make sure you got the certificate of divorce. But Jesus brings them back to the truth of, well, no, no, that wasn't, well, here it is. Their rebuttal is, well, God commanded it. God commanded from the beginning that we put away our wives. But in verse 8, he said to them, because of your hardness of heart, that's why. Here's why Moses gave that concession, not a command, and we'll talk about that. But he, it's because of the hardness of of your heart that Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But look what Jesus does. He goes right back to the beginning. But from the beginning, it was not so. What he's saying is divorce was never part of God's plan for marriage. So for you all now to say, well, God commands. <laughs> it's a commandment that we can divorce. He says, no, no, no. It's the hardness of your hearts that God allows you to divorce. And I say to you, he goes on here in this very passage, just like he did in the, in the former passage in, in chapter 5, but I say to you, and there it is, Jesus says, I understand what the Pharisees have been teaching. I understand what the traditions have, have been saying. I understand how you've twisted the law, but I say that I am the authority. I am the lawgiver. Here's what my law means. 
But I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for, the, for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. Now, the other Gospels put it like this. I say to you, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. Now, the very basic teaching of this is anybody who puts his wife, the way these guys are speaking about it, right? This no-fault divorce. I'm just tired of my wife. I see a prettier wife. She burnt my biscuits or whatever. And I put my wife away. What Jesus says is those days are gone. That, that idea of accepting that and doing it in the name of God and doing it under the cloak of Phariseeism and religiosity that's not what God intended. As a matter of fact, I'm telling you as the one who ordained marriage, as God himself, Jesus says, I'm telling you that if anybody divorces his wife and marries another, he's guilty of adultery and so is she. That's, that's the initial teaching. However, we do have a clause here, do we not? Save for the cause of fornication. And it's important that we... That we that we discuss this a minute, because there's a lot of debate, even among Christians, about is there really any ground for divorce? Matthew's the only gospel that puts this. Mark doesn't, Luke doesn't. And so some have said it's an interpolation that Matthew has kind of added in that it really wasn't meant to be there, so they'll, they'll take the strong stance that says there is no grounds for divorce for, it, for anyone, period. Although, I am not that guy. I, I don't believe this is an interpolation. I believe this is, this is God's word. There's, there's no question. All the manuscripts have this. There's no evidence of an interpolation. So, so what's going on here? Why didn't Matthew and Luke put it? I personally believe that Matthew and, and Luke believe people already understood these things. They didn't have to repeat it. They didn't have to put that in. They understood. But Matthew makes it very clear, giving his account of what Christ said, that there is this clause. And it's just. And it even goes along with all of Scripture when you think about it. What is the idea of marriage? Two people becoming one in a covenant relationship. And God joins them together, and nothing can separate that. Nothing except death. And when somebody dies, that covenant is broken. There is no more covenant. Now, the surviving spouse is free to remarry. So the covenant has been broken. So really, the only thing that allows us to remarry is a broken covenant. Death breaks that covenant. But you know what else breaks that covenant? Infidelity. An adulterous affair breaks that covenant. And therefore, it's consistent with all of the scriptures that a person who has been in a covenant that is now broken, the innocent party then, according to Christ here, and consistent with all scripture, has the right, the, uh, the, the legal, if you will, right, to remarry. So there, there it is. Now, Having said that, we don't jump on board here and say, well, man, I'm going to divorce because my spouse was unfaithful to me 10 years ago or whatever. And then, then you've got this whole thing of, well, what, what constitutes adultery? Is it just looking at somebody or thinking about somebody like we said last week? What constitutes adultery, right? So now we've got a whole other Pharisaical thing going on in, among Christians. Well, I think I'll, I saw my wife looking at somebody. I'm divorcing her. I know she had adultery in her heart. So, so what do we do with that as believers now? I'm talking about believers now. Now that we've seen the Word of God and we do see that Jesus does say, according to his authority, he's saying, yes, marriage is forever, and one who divorces for any reason, just any old cause, and you marry somebody else, you're committing adultery because your covenant has not been broken. Man can't break that. That covenant, God puts you together in that covenant. So that's what Jesus is saying. You think you've, you've been all right because you can go ahead and sign a certificate in that legalistic way? You can now say, I'm, I'm okay to remarry? No, you're not. And therefore, if you do frivolously put away your wife for any reason and marry another, you're committing adultery. Unless that covenant has already been broken. And only in that case. That's what he says there. Save except for the cause of fornication one who remarries commits adultery, save for the cause of fornication. Now, we've already mentioned this, that God calls this, Jesus himself called it a concession. The Pharisees called it a command. God's not commanding divorce. So let me, let me start there. For Christians, the first thing we need to understand in our marriages, 
when even, even in the, we do, first of all, everything in our power to fight for our marriages. We do everything to stay together, stay faithful. That's first and foremost. And, and it's not even about being happy as much as it is being faithful. We're called to be faithful in our marriages because that's a picture of the covenant that God has made with us who are unfaithful, right? And yet he stays faithful and he keeps that covenant. That's the picture of a believer. So, no, so, so even in this case, when infidelity comes up in a Christian marriage, the first knee-jerk reaction is not to say, well, there's the clause. Jesus commands me to divorce. He's not even commanding divorce in that sense. He's just saying this, this would be the only way that a person could remarry and not be committing adultery. So the, what I'm saying is the first approach must be, the first approach for Christians is reconciliation. Always. Forgiveness Reconciliation. I know it's hard. And it doesn't always end that way. But I'm saying as believers, we must not just be like a Pharisee looking for the first loophole or the first way out. What should we be? We should be like Christ. We should be like our Heavenly Father. We should forgive because we've been forgiven a lot. Now, I know that's hard. But what does that do? It shows when we, when we do that. What does that do when, when couples... When one is wrong, the other one with infidelity. And yet, the wounded spouse forgives the one who perpetrated the offense. And they reconcile and, and they stay together. What does that do? It gives glory to God and it represents the gospel. It's a picture of that, that glorious forgiveness that we receive in Christ. I believe without a question, the Bible teaches us all through the idea of reconciliation, that we are to be peacemakers, that, we are, that, that our first response is not to divide, but to come together. Only by the grace of God, yes. But there's a story in the Old Testament of Gomer and Hosea. And God uses that for, for a purpose. It's a very unique story, very odd when you first read it. What does it say? What, what do we see there? We see a guy named Hosea that God says to him and Chapter 1, verse 2, he says, I want you to go marry a prostitute. Now you think, wow. See, it's already odd, right? That's an odd thing. God says, Hosea, I want you to marry a prostitute. And then, he does. And it seems like a wonderful thing. She's faithful for a while. But then, as you go through the course of the book of Hosea, you see that she becomes very unfaithful again and goes after many, many lovers and betrays Hosea over and over again. And then in verse 3, we see another interesting thing. God comes to Hosea and says, Go again and love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress. So he said, I want you to go now to her who has prostituted herself out there and is loving another and, and has committed adultery. But I want you, Hosea, to go love her, to bring her back, to reconcile with her. Wow. And why is that, why is that story even there? Why would God record this for us? Why did this happen? Well, it's, it's, the answer is given right in the very verse because it goes on to say this. He wants him to love her as an adulteress and to forgive her and to bring her back to himself even as the Lord loves the children of Israel though they turned to other gods. You see, all of us, folks, go astray. We are all in this covenant relationship with our Heavenly Father. We are not keeping the covenant. We break the covenant. We, we, are, we, we betray him. We are idolaters. We worship things and ourselves more than him. That is spiritual adultery. And that's, that's why it, it, it's, it's, it's amazing. For those of us who have truly been redeemed, we get the significance and the impact and the magnitude of this. God should divorce us and cast us into outer darkness. And pour his wrath out on us. We deserve that. And yet, what do we see? We see... He comes after us. He pursues us. And he keeps the covenant. He gives us a new heart that we may be willing now to love him. He changes and transforms us by his grace. That's amazing. 
He's for, and he forgives us. Justifies, just as if I'd never sinned. He washes it away. As far as the east is from the west, all of that transgression and wickedness and betrayal. And he brings me to his arms, into his bosom with his arms, and, and dances over me and loves me in Christ. That's amazing. But you see, the idea there is this, folks. We must have the same heart in all of life, but especially in our marriages. And this would be, again, I, I pray that, again, you, you preach a message like this hoping that we never need it. But, folks, when that time comes, I pray because sin happens. We're sinners. We're not perfect. And when these hurts and betrayals happen in our marriage, I pray that all of us, by God's grace, will be brought back to these truths of Scripture and reminded the fact that we've all betrayed, and yet we are called to forgive. And may he give us this ability to just glorify him in our marriages with reconciliation, even in that, that time of betrayal, for the glory of God, showing the goodness of the gospel and showing what it means to be covenant people. So I know these are hard. These, these are not easy. This, this kind of message is difficult. And only by God's grace will we receive it. And in our culture, when we believe things like this, it's not easy. And as we continue to rest in the Word of God, we will continue to be made fun of and face strong opposition. So I encourage us all, as, as First Peter did, let us suffer well for Christ. Let us stand firm on the Word of God. Let us in love, tell folks who ask us, what? You, you believe what? You're doing what? Leave the bum. Be happy. You're going to do what? Let us be willing in love to tell people, have you not read? Have you not heard? I must obey my Father. I must obey Him rather than men. Let's pray for the grace to do that in all areas of our life. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth. We thank you for the church. Father, we're here to encourage each other, to build each other up in these things. Let us do that. Let us encourage one another. There will be times in the lives of friends that these things happen, betrayal or brokenness or heartache. Let us encourage people, first and foremost, to love your word and to faithfully strive for reconciliation. We know we're broken. We know it doesn't always happen. And we know that your grace is sufficient. But Father, we pray that first and foremost, we will rest on your word and do the hard things for your glory. We pray these things in Christ's name.